Congratulations to you all on your enrollment at the University of Tokyo. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the university, I would also like to extend my heartfelt congratulations to your families who have supported you for so long. This autumn, a total of 810 students have enrolled in our graduate schools and 32 students in our undergraduate college and the faculties, including 675 international students. Our campuses are becoming increasingly international places where people can learn from each other's different values and opinions and deepen their understanding of each other. I am sure that you are all excited about studying and doing research at the University of Tokyo. In the 145 years since its foundation, U-Tokyo has produced high-level research in many fields, and we have a rich abundance of resources to support it. We will do our utmost to help you so that you can make the most of this environment and concentrate on your studies and research to the fullest. Our world has experienced some severe shocks recently. First, with the spread of COVID-19 since early 2020, and then with the Russian military invasion of Ukraine in February this year. Neither crisis shows clear signs of resolution yet. The pandemic has not only placed a heavy burden on healthcare professionals, it has also had a profound economic impact on countries throughout the world. It has brought to light many problems, including widening disparities in income and working conditions, both in Japan and internationally. Poverty rates in developing countries, which had been declining, increased in 2020. And problems have emerged with the equitable distribution of vaccines and medical supplies. The news reports each day on the destruction caused by the war and the suffering of the refugees and themselves are difficult to bear. But equally disturbing have been the international political wrangling and the prioritization of national interests. Those issues have opened the door to further conflict and they have revealed the dysfunction of international organizations based on multilateralism. It is as if we have returned to the nationalism and world wars that cast a dark cloud over the 20th century. Meanwhile, today's world is connected by complex supply chains. And food shortages, price hikes, energy crisis, and other problems are having a profound impact on people's lives. With today's world more interconnected than ever before, we face many challenges for which systemic solutions are not yet available. I'd like to describe two examples now. The first is a case of litigation about liability for climate change. In 2015, a farmer in Peru named Saul Luciano Liuya filed a lawsuit against a distant party 
the largest power company in Germany. Glaciers in the Peruvian Andes have been melting due to climate change, causing lake levels to rise and increasing the risk of flooding where the farmer lives. The lawsuit was based on calculations by researchers and an environmental organization that the German company had contributed the melting of the glaciers by emitting around 7 billion tons of greenhouse gases over the previous 160 years. At first glance, the lawsuit seemed very unusual and it was dismissed by a lower court. On appeal, however, a higher court ruled that further investigation was needed. And in May of this year, a group including both scientists and judges began a field investigation. So this is the first time a full-scale investigation has begun in such a case, and many people are following it closely. Of course, the plaintiffs must present scientific evidence. Also, that power company has been operating under German laws and regulations. How can that one company be held responsible for something going back more than 100 years? Aren't the consumers of electricity also responsible Many such issues need to be resolved. But one might also ask how this case is different from lawsuits about air pollution released by factories into nearby areas. In those lawsuits, air is considered to be a local public good that is harmed by pollution. Isn't a suit against the German company, just shifting the focus to the global public good? Even if that company cannot be held legally responsible, doesn't the human race as a whole bear some ethical responsibility? Cases like this show the inadequacy of our current system of laws and litigation. My second example is the conservation of biodiversity. The United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which came into force in 1993, sets international targets on a regular schedule. One focus of the targets for the year 2030 is the treatment of genetic resources. The world's developing countries possesses many natural resources, including tropical forests, rainforests. Those countries say that they own the genetic resources of the plants and animals within their territories. And they want a share of the profits from any activities that use those resources. On the other hand, developed countries that are trying to utilize those genetic resources argue that the resources should be accessible as the knowledge derived from those public goods benefits all of humanity. <clears throat> this controversy seemed to be another dispute between the global south and north. We need to establish rules that can be agreed upon by many countries, such as how genetic resources are defined, who has ownership rights, who is allowed to utilize them, and how the profits generated from them should be distributed and managed. 
laws and regulations as well as penalties are also needed to address new technologies for using genetic information because in some cases gene sequences can be used for research and development without any need to physically transport the plants and animals outside of the originating countries. While these issues were argued about even before the Convention on Biological Diversity came into effect, as the economic value of genetic resources rises, it is becoming increasingly difficult to reach any agreement. In 2010, procedures for the fair allocation of profits were written into the Nagoya Protocol, but their implementation remains controversial due to a lack of consensus on definitions and procedures. Currently, a framework linking biodiversity conservation to corporate activities is also being developed. In the case of climate change, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, was established to review the impact of corporate activities on climate. In 2017, that task force released its final report about what should be disclosed by companies and other organizations. Utokyo Innovation Platform Company, or Utokyo IPC, an investment subsidiary of the University of Tokyo, has expressed its support for the TCFD. While the TCFD is focused on climate change, in March this year, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, or TNFD, released a draft document on biodiversity disclosures. And discussions are now underway on what information companies should be required to disclose related to biodiversity. These two cases show that it is difficult to solve global problems with our current systems and mechanisms. We need to establish new frameworks that involve many stakeholders. That lawsuit about climate change raises the question of how we should manage our activities within the existing rules while still being held accountable for the impacts that our activities might have on other locations and on future generations. The current global trends in biodiversity raise the question of how the genetic resources of plants and animals, for which new applications are being discovered, should be linked to the well-being of all stakeholders. When designing new mechanisms, we cannot leave the rulemaking to legal experts alone. Instead, a comprehensive approach is required, one that incorporates scientific knowledge and appreciation of the uses and potentials of technology, an understanding of economics and culture, as well as our moral values as human beings. People have begun to criticize the practice of evaluating growth based only on economic indicators such as the gross domestic product, GDP, or gross national income, GNI. As shown by the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, a consensus has emerged that goals should be rooted in the principle that no one will be left behind. This represents a step forward for humanity as a whole, and the international community needs to continue re-examining 
its values in this way. I strongly felt these uh, changing attitudes when I went to Europe this spring to take part in the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. That event was held to mark 50 years since the conference in Stockholm that led to the establishment of the United Nations Environment Program that was in 1972. Participants came from all around the world to discuss the current state of planetary health. At the conference, I could see that we need to focus more effort on active cooperation and contribution from the global north to the global south over the climate crisis. Another thing that impressed me was the active participation of young people at the conference. They came as representatives of the generation that will lead discussions 50 years from now, sorry, leading to Stockholm plus 100. I really felt that it is essential for people of your generation to play a central role in solving these global scale issues, as you are the ones who will be affected personally. One thing that is important in such discussions is that they should be based on scientific evidence. The University of Tokyo, through our Center for Global Commons, and in collaboration with research institutions around the world, has developed and published the Global Commons Stewardship Index. This index is an attempt to reveal the current state of countries' impact on the global commons and to build a system to monitor the changes. By publicizing this index, we hope to encourage evidence-based policy making in each country, as well as to promote changes in behavior. The guiding principles of the University of Tokyo are described in the statement, U Tokyo Compass, subtitled into a sea of diversity, creating the future through dialogue. U Tokyo Compass emphasizes dialogue as the way to confront and resolve problems. Dialogue is not just a discussion or an exchange of information. Rather, it is the process of trying to know. In order to know, we need to ask questions. And to ask questions, we need to be interested in other people and have a real involvement in the matters being discussed. It is through dialogue that our understanding deepens and that we can build trust. I ask you all to try enriching your capacity for dialogue by engaging in in-depth dialogues with other people without assuming that you share the same assumptions. We also need to engage in dialogue with evidence itself. Research is a dialogue with phenomena, a practice of dealing with data honestly in order to find solutions. In the field of economics, for example, empirical research has made remarkable progress owing to the development of estimation methods that establish causal relationships and the wide availability of micro-level data. It used to be considered impossible to do experiments in the social sciences, 
But now such experiments are being conducted frequently and much research is being published. Let me give you an example from the field of education. In order to reduce poverty in developing countries, it is important to increase the number of years that children spend in school in order to boost their human capital and increase their opportunities to work. To this end, countries around the world have adopted many different policies. Some of those policies add incentives on the demand side for children to attend school, such as free tuition, benefit programs that are contingent on school attendance, and school lunch programs. Other policies enhance the supply side, such as increasing the number of schools and teachers, and improving teaching methods. Many studies have estimated the impact of each policy quantitatively. Surprisingly, the most cost-effective policy turned out to be giving deworming medicine to school children in order to free them from intestinal parasite. It costs only about $5 to extend one child's schooling by one year using this deworming medicine, compared with more than $1,000 per child through subsidy programs. This finding tells us many things. Not only did parents have more incentive to send their children to school because of the free medication, there was also a dramatic reduction in the transmission of parasites between children, so more children were able to stay healthy. As a result, fewer children dropped out of school. And not only did their years of schooling increase. Later studies have also shown that the children's nutrition improved and that after they grew up, they had higher incomes and became bigger consumers. Thus, the impact went far beyond education itself. This is a good example of how evidence acquired through research can be applied to policies that help people. The first robust experimental studies of the effect of the distribution of deworming drugs were conducted by Professor Edward Miguel of the University of California, Berkeley, and Professor Michael Kramer of the University of Chicago. Professor Kramer later became a Nobel laureate for his research. As digital technology has improved, more research methods like this have been developed. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting restrictions on travel imposed by many countries, there have been remarkable advances in the analysis and the use of satellite imagery. New fields of study are emerging in which new knowledge is created using innovative methods for collecting and analyzing data. Those methods include the analysis of cell phone location and call data, the digitization of vast amount of paper-based data, and analyses using machine learning. While dialogue with evidence is important, I would also like to point out the danger of relying too much on collected data alone. There are truths that can be uncovered by analyzing a large number of samples and universalizing and abstracting them. However, we must not ignore the diversity and individuality of each observation. 
which can be lost when data is aggregated. We must also remember the conditions and methods under which evidence is found. There is always a risk that we will reach the wrong conclusions and draw the wrong implications. While a good understanding of principles and theories is important to verify our interpretations of empirical data, we must also be sure not to abandon individuality and specificity as we pursue universality. Also important is the autonomy that each of us has as a researcher. Our ethics, our sense of responsibility, our ambitions. Our scholarly research can have a major impact on society and our flights of creation must take off from a firm foundation. Today, there is an abundance of data and analytical techniques available to us, and we can learn easily and acquire much knowledge through the internet. The how skills, that is, the methods for analyzing phenomena, are becoming more and more sophisticated and specialized. Those of you in the younger generation may think that acquiring those skills is the most important factor in pursuing cutting edge research. However, today, we also need to question more deeply what we create through our research. And we need to ask why we do that research to begin with. There are many textbooks and manuals on how to analyze, but no guidebooks about what to analyze or why we do so. We need to ask these questions and search for answers ourselves, while at the same time asking together with other people and looking for answers with them. Don't be afraid to engage in dialogue with people from other fields and other cultures. There is much joy and excitement to be found in the adventure of knowledge. The university that you have now entered, the University of Tokyo, is the ideal place for such explorations. And it is you who will build on our university's great traditions to create a brighter future. Congratulations once again on joining us at the University of Tokyo. I wish, I wish you all the very best of success here. <laughs>